Welcome everyone to Family of Christ. We're jumping right in the middle of our sermon series on Acts. Today we're going to be looking especially at an amazing story of how even in the midst of hardship and persecution, even at the worst points of your life, God can work all things out for good. Let's make our beginning today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, other than unbelief, do you know what the worst sin is? It isn't murder, pride, or adultery. Jesus tells us what it is in Revelation chapter, 13, uh, chapter 3, verse 16. He says, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out. So Jesus can't stand when we follow him with lukewarm loyalty, half-hearted commitment, indifference, and no passion. So God says, how dare you, knowing I've lovingly created you one of a kind, graciously provided all of your daily needs, sent my only son Jesus to die for you and have prepared an eternal place for you in heaven, how could you possibly ever live as though your relationship with me is only moderately important? So let's silently confess and apologize for all the times that we've followed the Lord in a fickle, or unfaithful way. Well, the Lord hears our sincere confession. I want you to think about Romans chapter 8, verse 1. It says, There is now, right now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because Jesus became one of us, because he lived our life perfectly, fulfilling all the Ten Commandments perfectly in our place, because he then offered his perfect life for ours on Calvary's cross, paying the full punishment for our sins and the sins of the world. Know that as you trust in him, who is risen and ascended and in control of all things, you are fully forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, let's take a look at two sections of God's Word this morning. First of all, from God's Old Testament Word, we want to look at Psalm 116, verses 1 and following. And just as an introduction to this reading, remember, it's talking about how during really hard time, troubling times, God still hears our prayers and delivers us. I love the Lord, for He heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. My God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the simple-hearted. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Here ends our first reading. Our text today for our message is God's New Testament word, which is recorded in Acts chapters 7 and 8. While the religious leaders in Jerusalem were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. By the way, 
everyone except the apostles. In other words, it's kind of like the church today. We as church professionals equip the lay people to spread the gospel. So they were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. And this is the word of our Lord. Every time we profess the words of the Apostles' Creed, you know what we're saying? We're saying, look at what God has done for you and me. So let's profess these foundational truths of our faith and life. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's watch today's sermon video. And again, we're going to be focusing especially at the first few verses of Acts chapter 8. Two days after her 17th birthday, Laura Welch was driving her father's Chevy Impala on her way to see a movie with her friend Judy at a local drive-in theater in Midland, Texas. While listening to the radio and chatting with her friend, Laura made a huge mistake. She didn't see a stop sign and slammed right into another car in that intersection going 50 miles an hour. Laura and her friend were shaken up and instantly recognized the car that they hit belonged to a classmate and a dear friend named Michael. He had been thrown from his car, suffered a broken neck, and by the time the ambulance arrived at the hospital, Michael was pronounced dead. And Laura knew it was all her fault. No words could describe her devastation. Even now, over 50 years later, Laura still understands the painful consequences of that tragic moment. It brought immeasurable pain and heartbreak to Michael's family, to her family, her school, and community. Unquestionably, she calls that the worst day of her life. How about you? What was the worst moment in your life? Like Laura, maybe it was a terrible accident, a job termination a severed relationship, a health crisis, or the sudden death of a loved one. As you reflect on that distressing, troubling, and afflicting season in your life, did it draw you closer to God or cause you to drift further from Him? Did it fortify your faith and deepen your devotion to the Lord? Or did you find yourself wondering, God, why did you allow this terrible thing to happen to me? Are you punishing me for some past offense? Well, as Christians watched Stephen being brutally murdered, that was undoubtedly the worst day in many of their lives. After all, Stephen was a beloved and cherished brother and leader in Christ. Last week we learned that Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit's presence, power, wisdom, and grace. And hoping to lead Jerusalem's religious leaders to repentance, Stephen, while on trial, spoke a very pointed and piercing message of law and gospel to them. But instead of being receptive to the truth 
and remorseful over their hardness of heart, the mob turned on Stephen with rage. They seized him, dragged Stephen outside the city where they stoned him to death. And unfortunately, the violence didn't end there. Instead, it became open season on every Christian. God's Word tells us in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, on that day a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So men and women, boys and girls, instantly had to run for their lives, but some of them couldn't run fast enough. Because according to Acts chapter 8, verse 3, Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. So at once, the early church's peaceful existence was radically toppled. Those early Christians must have been dazed, wondering, why did God not rescue Stephen? And why wasn't he intervening and putting a halt to all this persecution? Now, instead of everyone happily gathering together to worship, pray, serve, and break bread in Jerusalem, their survival hinged on hastily pulling up their roots, leaving behind their valued friends and security, and scattering in every direction. By the way, whenever we experience these worst of our days of our life, well, they're always distressing and untimely, but they shouldn't be surprising. Because keep in mind what Job once said in Job 14, verse 1. He said, man born of woman lives but a few days and they are full of trouble. In addition, Jesus once stated a very similar thing in John chapter 16, verse 33. He says, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So if anyone lives long enough in this broken world, he or she will experience troubles, hardships, difficulties. That's a given. Yet at the same time, our worst days can never change God's nature, his purposes, nor his limitless love for you and me. And praise God, he's in the business of turning our calamities into opportunities, our setbacks into comebacks, and our negatives into positives. Perhaps you recall God's purpose for all of us when he started this, when we, remember when we started this series on the book of Acts several weeks ago. What's God's purpose and mission for us? Well, right before ascending into heaven, Jesus said these words in Acts 1 verse 8, you will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, right, locally, and then in Judea, in our, you know, like it would be the state of Minnesota, and Samaria, and eventually to the ends of the earth. So our Lord's desire is for all of his followers, including you and me, to tell as many people as possible in our circles of influence what difference Jesus makes in our day-to-day -day life. So the church's motto and maxim should never primarily be come and see, instead it should be go and tell. And as long as all of the believers were staying together in one place, Jerusalem, how could people in Samaria and Cyprus, in Athens and Alexandria, in Asia and Africa, and ultimately in Minneapolis and in Ham Lake, believe in Jesus Christ? You see, Jesus wanted his gospel to reach to the ends of the earth so that as many people as possible could one day have a heavenly home. So let's go back to Acts chapter 8. There's one crucial word found at the beginning of verse 4. Therefore. Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. That crucial word, therefore, is so pivotal because as a result of numerous negative circumstances and events, included Stephen being murdered and persecution breaking out against the church, the Lord forced Christians to disperse to new cities, new countries, and new regions. And wherever they went, they spread the good news of Jesus. They started Bible studies. They baptized new believers. 
They planted new churches and the kingdom of God advanced. Subsequently, they took the message of Jesus to every corner of the earth. That's what God intended all along. And the church is always more effective when it's scattered than just simply gathered. By going to where the people are, the Holy Spirit used those Jesus followers then and still today to quickly turn the world upside down for Christ. Well, just for a moment, let's skip down to Acts chapter 8, verse 8. Notice what it says there. So there was great joy in that city. So a story starts out with senseless tragedy, right? Stephen being murdered, persecution breaking out against the entire early Christian church. But it ends up with a guy named Philip, whose story you're going to hear about more next Sunday. Well, Philip flees to a city in Samaria, where he teaches and preaches about Jesus. Many souls are saved, numerous people are miraculously healed, and as a result, there's great joy in that city. Now, no one could have possibly foreseen, envisioned, or predicted any of this except God, who works out everything to accomplish his good will and to greatly bless many, many people. Would you say this verse with me, recorded in Romans 8, verse 28? You know this famous verse. Let's say it together. We know in all things God works for the good of those who love him. God doesn't cause bad things to happen in your life and mine. These happen because of our poor choices, bad decisions, and sometimes just living in a broken, sinful, demon-filled world. But sometimes God allows these things to happen, always with this promise attached. You can be sure that every detail in your life of love for God will be worked into something good. So what? How does this story from God's word apply to you and me? Well, it pertains to us both individually and collectively as a church. First of all, let's talk about how this section of God's word applies to us individually. Remembering, remember my opening story about Laura? Laura Welch, who on the worst day of her life accidentally killed a classmate, a friend, in a tragic car accident? Well, in the aftermath of that disaster, instead of blaming God and drifting from him, she wrote years later in her autobiography that the only real strength that never failed her was her faith in God. Never again did Laura Welch Bush, the former first lady of the United States, carry a casual attitude about life or about her trust in Christ. Well, in the same way, perhaps you currently find yourself in the middle of one of these crushing seasons of life. Remember, our good God is still at work in your nightmare, though sometimes we don't always see it. As God's word declares in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And the most important part of today's story about Stephen's death and the preaching uh, and the preceding persecution that broke out against believers is a simple phrase found in Acts chapter 8, verse 5. Notice what God's word says here. Philip went down to a city in Samaria, Samaria and proclaimed Christ there. So undoubtedly, Philip was shattered at the death of his good friend Stephen. But he did what all of us must come and must do to come out of these worst days of our life. There is no middle ground. Either you abandon your faith in God as being useless, or you courageously keep breathing, keep moving, keep believing. Like Philip, you don't turn away from God or your family of faith. Instead, by turning to God for your strength, you will discover a wonderful reality. That God can use the worst days of your life to take your, to take your faith, your perseverance, your character and service and hope to levels you never thought possible. That's power. 
the kind of power that you'll only discover under the care of the Holy Spirit. So when you wake up in the morning after the worst day, read your Bible. When you get over the shock, pray. When you gather, you know, when you're gathering your wits about you, trying to put all the pieces together, spend time praising and thanking God for his countless blessings. And when Sunday comes, be in church around your brothers and sisters in Christ who care deeply about you. These are all faith steps that you keep taking step by step by step forward, no matter how small they may be. Just keep walking in trust. And in time, God will do just as he promised in Isaiah 61, verse 3. He says there, I will bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Finally, how does today's account from Acts chapter 8 apply to us collectively as a church. Well, years ago, church consultant Tom Rayner wrote a book that was titled The Autopsy of a Deceased Church. This was the book cover, which even looks ominous, right? Run dark grays and really reminding us of death. But in this book, he addresses common factors in churches that are dying. Now, keep in mind, Hundreds of churches in America die. They close each and every year. And thousands right now are on life supports. So here is the autopsy of a dying church. That church refused to look like the community. In other words, the church members had no desire to reach their new neighbors and residents. Second of all, the church had no community focused ministry. There were no attempts to serve the community. Third, there was no evangelistic emphasis. The church became inwardly focused and lost its passion for reaching the lost. Next, the church had no clarity as to why it existed. There was no vision, no mission, no purpose. And finally, the members idolized another era. Jesus once confronted a church in the ancient city of Sardis by saying these words in Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. He said, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. No church ever wants to hear these words from our Lord. Instead, may God's grace empower us to be a church like the one that we just reviewed today in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. By the Holy Spirit's power, they were vibrant, bold, relational, alive. No matter what opposition they encountered, they weren't paralyzed by fear or surrendering in any way. Instead, wherever they were scattered, they went out and boldly shared the good news of Jesus. They kept pressing forward with the mission that Jesus had entrusted to each of them to be his witnesses. Imagine if each of us as members of this church looked at ourselves as being sown, scattered, right where God wants us to be. He has planted us at this time in this community to reach and serve the people around us with the good news of Jesus Christ right where they're at? Are we penetrating the neighborhood around us as the hands, as the feet, the voice, and the ears of Christ, knowing that that's God's purpose for our lives and that purpose will always prevail? Well, let's close by saying together the words of this dangerous prayer. Would you pray with me? Lord, I want to move beyond the ordinary and expected. Your plans for my life far exceed my power and abilities. So empower me by the vastness of Jesus' love and forgiveness. Then move me by your Holy Spirit to witness, care, serve, and live in ways that glorify you. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Let's pray now together some other words. I'm going to bring up some prayer petitions and then leave a moment of silence for you to lift up names that are on your hearts. So our prayer this morning is simply this. Jesus, we come boldly before you this morning because you have forgiven our sins, claimed us as your own, and given us your Holy Spirit. You have graciously blessed us and provided us with so many things. Today, I'm especially grateful and thankful for And Lord, you promise to be with us at all times. Your presence provides constant comfort and direction. Pour out your wisdom and guidance on this person who is currently struggling. God of peace, it's easy to hold on to grudges, resentment, and hatred. Bring forgiveness and healing in my relationship with this person. And God of peace, we thank you for calling all of us to be your bold witnesses. Now open our ears, our mind, our hearts, and then help us to reach out to this individual who we know is currently drifting and separated from you. Father, thank you for our governing officials, judges, and all of those who serve in the armed forces, the police and fire departments. Please give a special measure of your protection and strength to this person. Finally, Lord, strengthen and heal Wally Anderson, Joel Boson, Peggy Coburn, Randy Cornelius, Karen Larson, Bob Larrabee, Craig Odegaard, Mark Savaria, and these people whom we silently name to you. Into your hands, Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught all of us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his perfect peace. Amen. Well, let's head out with these sending words right from God's word. Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. So knowing God can turn catastrophes into opportunities, let's go in peace and serve the Lord. God's richest blessings on your week ahead.